Okay, are you ready, guys? Can we, can we start? Um, hello, my name is Valerie, and uh, I'm a product marketing manager at ChatBrains. And I want to thank you uh, for being here today. I'm very glad that uh, you are here. I've checked the program, and I know that's, that's a hard choice. So, yeah, thank you again. And I want to talk about developing the product vision in teams and individuals a little bit. But before I start, just I'm going to do a really quick introduction. Uh, how many of you know JetBrains? Okay, everyone knows. That's great. And how many of you actually use our products? Oh, a lot of people. Uh, great, great. Uh, so, I'm not going to talk about our products uh, today. Just a really quick introduction. Uh, we are JetBrains and we're creating tools for developers and development teams. And we also have our own language, Kotlin. Probably you're familiar with that. So, that's it. And I want to talk about the teams and the people behind these products and how we actually work on them. And I hope that our experience might be useful for you and you can take something out and try maybe for yourself or for your team or for the whole company. So how we work. Uh, we are about, uh, we are 18 years old. We are about 900 people and we are growing really fast. So I have these numbers from the last week and it might change already. Yeah, but not that dramatically. So yeah, about 900 people uh, and we still have flat structure. And what I mean by flat structure is that we have CEO of the company on the very top level. Then we have product teams and every product team has a team lead. And basically that's it. No other layers, no other dimensions, just it. And every product team includes everyone that we need to in order to build the product. So that's developers, QA testers, support engineers, marketing managers, technical writers, um, everyone. So we are pretty independent in that way. In most of our teams, we don't have product managers, I mean, as a separate role, as a separate person who plays this role um, in most of the teams. And in this, in this case, the whole team uh, is involved in product management, uh, of course, to various degrees. And I'm going to tell you a bit later, like, how it works for us. Uh, in most of the cases, again, we create our products in order to re relieve our pain. And since we are developers and we create products for developers, we truly believe that it's not our pain, only our pain. There are millions of developers uh, in outside world, and by creating our products, uh, we believe that we might relieve their pain as well. But it normally starts like from our own problems and our own issues as being uh, software developers. And we also believe that we are a native agile company, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit later what it means for us. So that's like the, the really, really basic structure. And so about being native agile company, let's look at the agile manifesto. Probably you've seen it, right? So what it says, it says build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get their job done. So from here, we can see that it's all about motivated individuals and their skills and trusting them and building the environment uh, to help them to get their job done. So we can see that development of personal qualities increases the effectiveness of the whole team, uh, of the products, and of course, of the whole company. So I've analyzed like how different teams work at JetBrains and try to find some similar uh, skills and mindset that it's shared across uh, all our teams. Um, they are really, really different and independent, but there are some things that, um, that all shared inside the company. And the first and the maybe most important skill is professionalism. But I mean professionalism is not in the way that uh, we are experienced enough to try out this technology and to have uh, experience with this or that framework or language. Uh, it's more about uh, to be self compassionate and self-assured about the level of the professionalism that like we have and to be first of all willing to make decisions and to participate in creating the product and not just doing uh, some coding or doing just some job 
and it's also about the willingness to uh, take responsibility for these decisions. Because when you have a freedom, you know, to decide something, you always have responsibility. That's the other part. So being professional enough to be willing to do that, that's a very important for us. Another thing in such in informal and flexible process when you don't have managers that actually tells you what to do and how to do your job uh, is a self-management. And without that, like we believe that is crucial for us because again, in such a flat structure, when you are willing to make decisions and take responsibility, you also need to uh, manage your own work. So what it means is that um, Normally, every developer has a, a part of the product that they are responsible for, and uh, they are prioritizing the, the work that they want to do inside this uh, subsystem or part of the product uh, mostly by themselves. So they get the box from the customers and they get feature requests and things like that. Of course, we discuss it, we have roadmaps, uh, but normally still they need to actually organize their work and to decide like how to prioritize things. Another thing that we believe is, is important is creativity. And uh, creativity, it's, it's an interesting thing. And it's important on different levels of, uh, of creating the products. So it starts from the idea of the product and like what we want to do and how we want to set our goals in creating something new. And then it goes down to the next level of creating new features. And here, creativity is also crucial because like, we need to decide what is the best way to create this feature and uh, how, it, how it would work best for our customers. And even on the level of the, uh, of the implementation and improving and tuning the process, creativity is also important. Uh, of course, there are a lot of tasks that uh, not always require creativity. There are some things that just need to be uh, kept stable and working right and maintained. And yeah, it's important as well. But without applying the creativity to most of the work that we do, um, it might get, you know, tough. The next thing I want to talk about is involvement. And uh, we believe it's really important um, if you look at the numbers, I've checked the Gallup report for the last year, and it says that only about 15% of the employees around the world are actually involved into their work. And so what, what does it mean to be involved? Of course, first of all, we are, as I said, we are creating products for ourselves. And of course, we are involved, right? And this is a pretty natural way, you know, to be involved in what you are doing. And that's also related to the state of flow that uh, we can catch um, when we are involved in something. And it's also related uh, to the level of the professionalism because uh, it increases with the number of hours that you spend being in the flow, right? So all of these are connected. Building a shared vision. Uh, again, when you have an um, informal team without um, really strict processes, it's, it's really important to keep this vision because when everyone has a freedom to do um, the features and the things that they want to do and they believe is important, though without keeping the uh, shared goals and shared vision, uh, it would just, you know, fall apart. So everyone would do just whatever they want to do. Uh, so yeah, keeping and tracking this shared vision is also important for us. And the last thing, but not the least, of course, is trust. And when I talked to the team, uh, it appeared that uh, trust, it's like the two-way street, and there are two, um, two separate parts here. So one part is to uh, trust your colleagues, to trust your team members, that they would find the best solution for the uh, task they have, for the problem they're trying to solve. Uh, and here again comes the professionalism and all this stuff. And if we trust each other, then we can concentrate on our own task and to be sure that you know the other things would be covered and this is a really important feeling. But the other part of that, and which is maybe even harder, uh, is to give a trust from the team lead to the team. And what they said when I asked them is that 
um, the hardest thing for leading a team is just to lose control and to trust the team to get the work done. And that's what the, the, they're trying to cope with. And that's the thing that uh, they believe is important. And they're trying to do their best to actually um, expose it. So these are the qualities. And now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, give you some examples of product teams and uh, describe how they work. And just to give you an idea of how the processes can be different, but still they are imposing these qualities that I discussed into their process a lot. So how they actually do that. The first example I want to give is the Rider team. And Rider is a pretty new product. That's our cross-platform.net ID. And that's the mixture of IntelliJ and ReSharper. So that's very interesting uh, in terms of like technical solution and the task that they have there. And also uh, the team is really young and really enthusiastic and full of startup spirit and all of that. So how they create their product. Um, how is the product manager role is shared inside the writer team? Uh, again, it's shared among the whole team. They have a team lead and the team lead plays the role of mediator here. So uh, his main goal is to track the, the product vision and to track the high level goals and to make sure that the whole team is on the track and everyone is um, keeping this, this product vision and sharing the same goals. Uh, they have subsystem owners. Well, subsystems are the parts of the product, and uh, uh, there are people who are responsible for these parts. So, of course, they have the product vision like locally inside their particular part, and they know the best like what's going on there, uh, what they need to introduce there, what they need to fix inside, and that's important as well. And again, every team mem member participates in product management uh, to some degree, of course. Uh, release planning. Um, about two or maybe already three years, we switched from like one major release per year for our IDs to like three major releases. So it means that before every release, they do the release planning and it happens like every, say, four months. So first of all, the team leads formulates a role plan in his head. Uh, he, he said that he just walking around the office and thinking for some time. Sometimes it takes like several days. And then he comes with a really, really raw plan of the most important features that uh, he believes they want to introduce into the next version. Then he goes and communicates separately with subsystem owners and uh, trying to get the vision of their uh, specific part. Then they get together and formulate the minimum plan of the required features they want to introduce into this version. And when I ask them, like, uh, why you don't create a, like, a complete plan? Why don't you plan everything? And so they say that uh, they tried it and it didn't work for them because there are always small features that developers just create and they just want to, you know, add to the release. And they think that it's fine for them. So as long as they have their goals and, and, they're, and they're done, they can also introduce some small nice things during the process. Uh, where do they take the backlog from? Like where do they get the ideas and the features? So first of all, of course, yeah, again, we're developers and we have our own ideas. So we also take ideas from, diff from other products inside JetBrains and in outside world as well. Uh, we have a public issue tracker, uh, U-Track, where all the customers can just go and contribute and create feature requests or file a bug. So we get a lot of ideas from there as well. We also have a voting there, so it helps us a lot to prioritize the pain uh, of our customers. We do a lot of conferences and we send a lot of uh, developers to work at the booth. Like you can see here, you're always welcome to come to our booth and talk to us. And why we do that, uh, in most of the cases, it's a great chance for the developers to communicate with the real users and to learn something from them, to get their feedback. And after they come back, sometimes they get like really, really good ideas for the new features, uh, just taking the outcomes of the talks from the conferences. 
We do meetings with clients uh, from time to time, and it also works well for us. Uh, hackathon, it's just a, a little bit specific thing for writer team because um, one of their goals is to provide support for Unity community. But we don't do any game development, so we're not great experts uh, in this sphere. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to interfere into this community and learn from them. So we did a hackathon and uh, uh, we created the teams combined like from uh, our developers and the community developers. And this way it helped us to like learn a lot about their needs and their thoughts and their like um, specific things. We also have a, a Slack public channel where they communicate with the community. They share ideas about the new features, get the feedback, and it also works really well for them. And yeah, we do a lot of uh, user group meetings like, like we do with the conferences. And there we get a lot of feedback as well. Then talking about feedback, it's, it's the crucial part of uh, of the process of creating our product. So on every single stage, uh, we want to make sure that we get enough feedback and we get it uh, as early as possible. So before every feature prototype uh, goes to the um, uh, to the like nightly build, it goes through the uh, demo for the team. And this way, on the first stage, we get internal feedback like from, from our own uh, colleagues. Um, then what we believe is also important is the internal communication between the team lead and developers because sometimes uh, the developer can work on a huge feature and it might take like several months and in order to make sure that during this process we're still on the track, we still have the same goals and we're not going, you know, uh, falling apart, uh, they communicate a lot and it helps them as well. Uh, from the very beginning, and we still do, uh, before every release, we open the EAP program. That's the early access program that uh, we share the unreleased uh, builds with the community, with our customers, I mean external customers. And uh, this program lasts for about two months before the release. And this way, we're getting a lot of external feedback. And sometimes it ends up that... Uh, we want to see, like, we thought that the feature is pretty ready for the release. Then we included it to the EAP, we got the feedback, and then we decided that, oh, no, we don't want to release it. We want to polish it a little bit, improve it, and maybe move to the next version. And sometimes it happens and it's fine. But most of the times it helps us to tune whatever is done and to, you know, make it better, like, before the release. So that's our way for getting feedback. And that's basically how the writer team works. And here's another team I want to talk about. Uh, this is Utrack team. Um, Utrack is an issue tracker and project management tool. So this is a, a team tool, not a personal tool. And it's not only for the developers. So it's a little bit different from the uh, product management point of view. And uh, in Utrack, we do follow kind of scrum process. And uh, we are pretty big and distributed team, so we have our own add-ons for the Scrum, and it works pretty well for us. So how is the product manager role shared in Utrack? Again, it's shared among all. We have a team lead, and in our case, he's a product owner. We have a Scrum master, and uh, she's one of the developers. And what, what, what we call her is the balance of forces, because uh, when you have a pretty mature product that's been like on the market for about eight years, it's, uh, it's pretty big. And there are also things that we want to do, we want to introduce some new features, but there are always things that we need to maintain, to polish, and keep an eye on. And so uh, our Scrum Master helps us to keep this balance between the new features and the main things that we need to do. We have subsystem owners as well, and they have the product vision locally. And each member of the team, to some degree, um, participates as well. Uh, instead of uh, like several times a year, we have a yearly planning. And for that planning, we normally go for multi-day retreats outside the city. We get together like the whole team. And what we do, we do like um, a lot of 
uh, sessions with the discussions and we do like organize them. So we have rules and we have topics and we have people who prepare that. And uh, actually the main goal here is to exchange the ideas and to uh, synchronize the whole uh, the product vision across the whole team. So that's the most important goal for us here. And so after the planning, we get a raw backlog. Uh, it's, it's, it's not like the feature set, it's not the completed roadmap. It's more like the direction we wanna move to during the next year. And then during the year, we add and like expand this backlog uh, all the time. We're trying to keep the direction that we agreed on, but we keep adding like small features and uh, reorganize our backlog. So it's not like stable, it's pretty flexible. Uh, we have standard uh, two weeks uh, sprints. And before every sprint, we do of course a sprint planning. And we divide it into two parts. So first we have a general part and the whole team is presented there. I mean, the marketing managers, the technical writers, uh, support engineers, everyone. And during this part, we discuss the uh, user stories that we're going to take and we discuss the criteria for how to demo them. And when we agree and everyone understands what we're going to do, then the technical part starts. And during this technical parts, it's just for the developers, sometimes for the QA engineers as well. Uh, they split the user stories by technical task and discuss the technical decisions. Sprint demo is my favorite part. So at the end of every sprint, we have a demo. And uh, this is a great motivation for the performer and for the whole team. Like this way, first thing, we like everyone knows what's going on and what new things are added to the product. And in the world where you don't have any technical documentation, no requirements, nothing, it helps everyone. So as a marketing manager, I know what I'm going to introduce to the customers. Technical writers knows like what they need to document. And the support engineers, of course, know like how they can help the customers. And also that's a great motivation for the developers who actually perform the demo. Because you can see that uh, during a really short time, it's just two weeks, we get something new and it's working and you can see it. I mean, it's, and it's pretty ready. So that's a great moment for us. After the demo, we, we have a retrospective. And of course, we discuss what was good, what went wrong. And there is one more thing that we do. Um, everyone may suggest a small feature for the next sprint. That's how we actually transform our backlog that I mentioned before. And um, we vote. And then we discuss whether we have a capacity to take this feature to the upcoming sprint or maybe we'll take it to the next one. And so we, this way like we transform our backlog. So this is how we work. I mean, the Utrek team, which like has a more or less stable and like standard scrum process. And now I wanna go a little bit higher and to see and talk about like the company values as a whole and the personal values and whether uh, there are any influence or connection between them and how we can nurture these values um, on the company level. So when I started to think about these questions, I realized that I need some input. So I went to our leaders and talked to them just to find out what they think about that. So I came to our CEO and asked like, uh, what are the company values and where do they come from? And he said that it's a really tough question because there were so many attempts for us to actually formalize our values and our culture. Uh, we tried to document it and, you know, like prepare a real document where it says, okay, here is the JetBrains values and culture, but it didn't work. So <laughs> at the end, we just uh, gave up and we decided that um, our culture, I mean, we believe that our culture is something that uh, shouldn't be just written down. It's something that you can feel in, in the atmosphere. It's something about like how people treat each other. It's something that we share by example and by, you know, our behavior in everyday life. And it's not something that we just write down and want someone to embrace this way. And there is um, some other important moment here Then, when you formalize something, you make it stable. And it means that uh, like you wanna fix it and you don't wanna change. 
But with us, it just doesn't work this way. We want to change and we want to uh, keep evolving. And we believe that it's important because there are so many new people that join us like every year, every month, and they also bring something new. And uh, we really um, value the things that they are introducing to us. So we want to um, change and to evolve. And we don't want to fix uh, our goals, uh, our values and culture. Um, the next question that I have was about like, how company uh, culture affects the personal qualities and can that be nurtured? I mean, can we nurture our employees, the company culture and the company values? And um, here there are, it, it, it depends a lot on the way uh, how the people actually uh, join JetBrains. Uh, because from one point, uh, we have a really uh, big student program and we support different universities, we take a lot of interns, so they do practice at JetBrains and then at some point they join the company. And for them, it's really easy to embrace the culture and values of JetBrains because they don't have any other experience. That's just something that they learn, they enjoy, and they're just fine with that. So like no problems here. But there are a lot of cases when uh, the people who worked in other places, in other culture, in the companies with other goals, joined JetBrains. And from the beginning, uh, sometimes they are kind of surprised. They said that, oh, okay, where is the set of the tasks that I need to do? Uh, where is the specification for the uh, work that we do? And then we say, like, we don't have it. So, and the, um, the set of the task, like, it's up to you to decide, like, and, and form actually your set of tasks. And so uh, it might be hard in the beginning, but normally after some time, like months or two, um, they get used to that and they really like it. So in most of the cases, it works this way for us. So at this point, I thought that maybe we're looking for people with specific mindset that it's really sim similar to ours. And like this way we get this, you know, unified uh, goals and values and culture. So I talked to our VP of human resources and um, she told me that uh, JetBrains is like so different. JetBrains is a set of subcultures that organically coexist together. And this is again the part of our culture. So we have like the general values and the general goals and still our teams are really, really independent. And we're fine with that, of being different, of uh, being diverse, of uh, sharing different, you know, subcultures and that's fine. And that's why we never hire anyone uh, for just JetBrains, uh, like, you know, we have, a very good Java developer, and so we just want to hire them for JetBrains. No, it doesn't work this way. Uh, we're always looking for a specific person for a specific role and specific team. And it's important for us to make sure that people do what's interesting to them. So we're not just put them into some random team and say that, oh, you'll enjoy it, <laughs> you'll be fine there. Because the teams are really, really different. And this way, like when we think about fitting and finding the right person for the right team, uh, it helps us to, to, to keep the culture this way. And there is one more important question about psychological safety on the company level. So uh, it, can be, um, it can be considered on the personal level then on the team's level, um, how, um, how safely you feel inside the team. And then if you go like one level higher, then we can talk about the company. And here, of course, we believe that it's important uh, to, to create the environment with, that ensures the psychological safety for all the employees. And we do work on that, but we see that maybe we're not doing enough, but we are moving into this direction. But they're also, they're, they're always um, the other side of this process. Um, we think about it as a, like a two-way street. So when we give this trust and when we create such an environment, uh, we also need to receive it, not only give. So when we 
when we create something, we are waiting for the people to give it back. And this way, we believe that it works better. Uh, does it all sound like a paradise a little bit? Like everything is so formal and free and yeah. Um, good, because I want to talk about the dark side now. Uh, because yeah, every coin has two sides. So when you're building a really informal and flexible process on the level of the teams and individuals in company, uh, you need to realize that uh, there are some problems behind that. So uh, discipline and self-management and responsibility can be challenging. And what does it mean? Um, think about the process when you don't have the um, strict goal and definition of done, when you set up the tasks for yourself, when you invent and decide like what is the best way to do something, you need to always be sure that, okay, I really found the best way. And the work that I did is like, is a really good one. And sometimes it's hard, I mean, just to keep this level of self assurance. And in order to, to solve this problem, I've talked to uh, many people and they say that like, yeah, we do have this problem. And in order to cope with that, uh, there are a lot of practices that they use starting from personal time management because we don't have any time reporting or time sheets, uh, like we don't report our time. So they, they like to, to keep the focus and to understand and to realize that I do keep the right focus. They're using some tools for time management. Um, they, some of them also use some techniques like Pomodoro um, to, you know, split the work and to be the to find the most um, effective periods and then to have some breaks. And some someone uh, practices the meditation and says that it it helps uh, a lot. And. The other problem is that uh, routine may kill the creativeness. So when you have a really new young product and that startup, everyone is so excited about that. That's the one thing. But when you have a mature product that's been there for you know, 10, 15 years, uh, there are so many things that we need to maintain and that so many things to fix and to keep and to polish, then yeah, sometimes it can be not that exciting. So these things may lead to lack of excitement, as I said, boredom, tiredness, and even burnout. So if you think of that, it's like the romantic relationship. When it starts, uh, you feel so good, you feel so involved, you want to spend together the 24 hours. So like in the work, you can work during the nights and during the weekends and uh, you find yourself in the flow and everything goes so well. But after a while, I mean, it goes down. I mean, this is the this is the law. And um, after some time, uh, you can find that uh, the passion is not so strong. And in this case, uh, the the relationship they can just end, and it happens. We know that, right? Or it can grow to something else, to something deeper with more respect and more trust, and even um, more enjoyable. So there are different ways here. And so how we try to solve these problems? Of course, there is not a silver bullet that we can share, but at least there are some, um, some steps and some activities that we try to do, and in, in some way it helps us. So every employee can get a 20% side project, and it means that like one day a week, uh, everyone can work on something else. Uh, it can be learning something, it can be some kind of a startup, uh, or joining some other team, some other product, or for example, giving a talks. So that's, that's the way it, that helps. Uh, sometimes, and we do encourage people to switch the team. So yeah, and with the new refreshed activities and people around, uh, it helps. We also encourage people to switch the role sometimes. So we see the developers uh, who moves into the developer advocacy, for example, and vice versa. Some of them moves into the product marketing and it's also fine. And even someone from the product marketing moves into the development. And it's, it also works for us. And every year we do hackathons. 
And during these two years, or uh, two days, uh, it's just the time for creativity. The whole work on the uh, normal project just stops and everyone is just doing something else. And um, as a result, um, you see this um, screenshot and that's an application, it's called Dolby. Uh, it was created on the hackathon this year and this is application for eternal hiring. This is just to illustrate that we do have these problems and we realize that it's important and this way we're trying to solve them. And as a result, this application won the third prize uh, during the general company voting. So yeah, we do believe that uh, it's important and Dolby helps us. Uh, there's one more topic I want to touch here is happiness at work. Uh, it's, it's more about like preventing the problems than trying to solve them. So uh, there is a research uh, done by Warwick University scientists and it says that happy employees are 12% more effective. So that's a good news, right? Let's make our employees more happy. What can we do about that? The first thought that you might have is that, okay, we can raise the salaries, right? Uh, we can do better offices. We can offer more benefits. It should make them happy, right? But unfortunately, it turned out, uh, according to the other research, uh, that the correlation between the income and the level of happiness exists on the uh, low level. And starting from the medium level, it just disappears. And this research was first done in the 70s uh, in the United States. And, and then they thought that, oh, you know, maybe it's valid just for the United States. And so they did it again in the beginning of 2000s. And there um, participated 164 countries. And they've got the same result. And when I say the medium level, of course, is different for different countries, right? So for the US, um, they say that it's about 65 to 75,000 per year. So like below this level, the correlation exists. And after this, it's, it's pretty hard to uh, make the employees happy uh, with the material things. So what can we do about that in such case? And uh, here is the concept of meaningful life. And right now it's becoming a mainstream in, in opposed to the consumerism uh, that we've been living for a while. And so what this concept says, uh, it says that meaningful life comes from connecting and contributing to something beyond ourselves. And there is an interesting book uh, by Emily Smith. Um, it's called The Power of Meaning. And uh, it combines the, the researches uh, for five years that were done in um, Stanford. And then she did a lot of interviews and uh, analyzed the level of happiness uh, of like uh, more than 500 people. And um, the result is, uh, is, uh, is here in this book. And uh, it says that uh, in our uh, real time right now, we are so chasing for happiness that this chase makes us unhappy. But instead of chasing the happiness, uh, when we search for something meaningful and find the purpose in our life, that's what makes us happy in the long term. Um, so we can see that the qualities that I was talking about in the, in the beginning, that's involvement, empathy, contribution, and finding a purpose makes us happy in the long term. Uh, it's like with um, doing some volunteer work or raising the kids. Uh, it can be not so pleasant in the moment, right? Because this is work and this is a hard work. And with the kids, probably uh, a lot of you know like, that there are things that you need to do every day and they're not always pleasant. But in the long term, it does make us happy. Um, and this way, again, by, uh, uh, by developing these qualities, we also get 12% more effective employees, which is good, right? So let's summarize. How to develop the product vision? What can we do about that? So first of all, it's about developing personal qualities. Um, so here, what are these qualities? These are professionalism, responsibility, self-management, creativity, involvement, 
and trust. The next thing we can do is to build a shared vision. Uh, sometimes uh, there are some companies uh, that think that, oh, okay, they, they are developers. They love to write code. So why should they care about our business goals or about our strategy or about the product vision? But it's not true. I mean, everyone cares. And that's, that's like finding a purpose. That's caring about something beyond our own um, goals and, and reasons. And that helps us to become a part of something big and to contribute in it. And again, to find the meaning in that. Um, another thing we, need, we, we can do is to involve the team into the product domain. Here you can say that, okay, you are JetBrains, you are developers, and you create products for developers. So it's really easy for you. And this is true. I mean, that's, yeah, the, the thing that we, we, we need to admit. But I believe that in any other domains, there is a way to uh, involve the team. Maybe to do some training or to do some learning or um, do some customer interviews just to, to understand better like how the product is going to be used. Who are our customers? What are their pains? Like what we can do to relieve it. And the next thing we can do is to create an environment where we encourage employees to observe the company culture and the value. And here it's, it's all about personal example. So it's like with the raising the kids, right? We can tell them every day what is good and what is wrong. But at the end of the day, everything they learned is just how we did it. Uh, because that's, that's the personal example and that's how it works. So if we create the environment and like we do it by personal example, that might help us to really share the culture and absorb the values. And don't forget that transformation always starts in our heads, in our beliefs, and not in the processes that we are trying to introduce as a team or as a company. Thank you. Yeah, and please write my talk. <laughs> uh, is there any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 even, it's even more related because uh, how it works for our ideas, uh, like we have an IntelliJ platform and we have a team who's like doing this platform. It's not even like one team, it's like several teams, right? And then we have a, a teams for uh, every like smaller IDEs. And so uh, these IDEs, they get the, uh, all the features from the platform. And then on the top, they create their own features. So yeah, of course they do communicate, and I mean they they have the same platform behind it. So that's why it, it like it feels the same, of course. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I'll be at the booth uh, at JetBrains, so please come. I'll be happy to talk, and thank you. <laughs>